an ascent and as usual is extremely honored for a particular reason tonight uh, to bring to you uh, your own friend the host of afghan ascent uh, theodros kiros uh, to read from his latest work called hero and hilo this particular special event uh, is tailored at expressing its deepest gratitude to my viewers thousands of you who take time from your very busy schedules to view my television program by staying tuned in, by writing letters to me, and by expressing your gratitude and appreciation of what this community television program, in conjunction with BNN, under the brilliant studio managership of Ms. Barbara Murray, with whom I have been working for the past eight years. Uh, I hope that you will enjoy uh, reading from my work, uh, Hewitt and Hailu, as I read it to you uh, slowly, lovingly, and devotedly. And thanks once again for coming to your living rooms and to other spaces in your place uh, to pay attention to Afghan ascent and stay tuned with us uh, as I read to you from Hewitt and Hailu. I'll begin reading <clears throat> from the uh, verse, uh, very first uh, part of uh, the combination of a novella and uh, a group of uh, short stories uh, called Hirut and Hailu. May I take uh, the time to introduce uh, my book to my viewers uh, by um, putting it um, right in front of you. Hirut and Hailu. And for those of you who may be interested in purchasing the book and reading it, it is available in Amazon.com. Once again, thanks for staying tuned in with us. The title of the ver uh, very first uh, chapter of the work is at your service. The music roars on as teenage girls who range from 13 to 19 survey the evening scene in a dimly lit disco the cockup in the city of Addis, Ethiopia. Teddy Afro's music is blasting inside the cockup and customers are dancing including many well-off expatriates with heavy European accents. The young girls are all charming and vying for the attention of the rich, young tourists, the most beautiful going for the wealthiest young men, showing them that they know how to bat their eyelashes. Leave them dazed, surging with lust, with nothing left remaining on their minds besides the promise of sex, a carnal promise. Cruising on high heels and miniskirts, which barely cover their asses, the girls are hyper-visible, and there are 50 of them or more. If you walk by, some of them aggressively grab at you, Insist that you talk to them. They are hardly afraid to express themselves. One young girl, small, nicely proportioned, does not seem to fit the scene. Her quiet demeanor stands out. This shy sort, mildly depressed. She sits alone at first. She walks outside the bar for a cigarette and puffing away, looks up at the galaxies, saying something to herself. A young man at the bar in his late thirties, khaki trousers, a white Calvin Klein shirt, tall and slim with big eyes, follows her. 
he too stands out in the crowd and looks rather lost. He's inside his own head, more so than he is physically in the bar. But now he's standing only a few yards away from her. She's gazing at the dark night, smoking cigarettes, puffing away, exchanging with him only a glance, one glance, only one. And then they each decide to stay without a word, to stay inside the bar, inside their own heads. She's about to walk back inside, but the young man quickly and boldly grabs her. She's not alarmed, is not afraid. She's willingly grabbed at and does not resist being placed in front of the young man where they stare at each other without fear. This is love. This is love. They exchange their names and begin, begin telling their stories. He discovers that she's a graduate of Addis Ababa University. He discovers that she discovers that he lives in Denmark, but has been caring for his ailing mother now, near Addis, for the last month. I'm not very expensive, that is, if you're interested. And if you do want me, she says, I am at your service. I am at your service. That is not what I'm interested in. I want to know you. What is there to know about a whore? She says, you may be a whore. That I don't know. But then, you're not just a whore. You are human. A human in a bad situation. The young man explains to the prostitute. I'm shocked that you're talking to me. I'm not used to this, she says. Normally, I'm handled like a ball, tossed and turned in dirty linen, and then thrown away like garbage. Nobody even knows my name. Well, I'm not like that, he says. I like your eyes. I like your voice, he adds. She smiles and thanks him. I was once an excellent student at a university, she says. I was even president of the English club. Your English is excellent, he replies. She continues. But then, but then life dimmed on me. And now, I cannot find a job. Only this one, to be banged for money. And this is a filthy life, which I've been living for two years now. For too long, longer than most girls can go without dying in this line of work in Addis. Most of them die early. And can you believe it? There are so many of us who live this way. 
as you can see around you. All the girls with short skirts at the bar, seductively going through the motions prostitutes make, motions for desperately needed money in a world where there is little but what comes from men in exchange for carnal promises. This is the horse hustle for money. We all have our own hustles. Each one of us always concealing from the customer some regrettable truth. A long life of nagging hunger and desperation for food of any kind. Without them to go with. And we conceal our hunger and the hunger of our children who may be starving to death at home. We must conceal this truth so that our customers only see a carefree and sexually driven face. Some of us are hiding a desperation for drugs. Some of us are hiding the desperation of knowing we will likely be dead in a year or less from some undiagnosed disease. Being careful to hide our rushes with dark makeup, pushed through tiredness and constant fatigue with energetic and wide opened eyes and lively and magnetic personalities that our earth, our wealthy customers actually draw life from at our expense. Some of us are dying of diseases we contract trying to make money to feed our infant children. The only way we can. Children who will grow up motherless. Who will be motherless. He fights back his tears and says, there may be a way out. Can we meet more at the city cafe? And they agree to meet the next day. The young man looks at her eyes very deeply before leaving. Walking in silence. Every time I walk, I remember what my philosophy teacher at the University of Denmark said. The best thoughts come to us only when we walk, when our blood moves. And that's how I feel right now, declares Hilo. A tone of truth can be sensed in his declaration. He listens attentively and says, I never thought of this. Now that he said it, I feel the truth of the statement. Now that he said it, I feel it even more. He wrote, invites him to walk to the Addis Ababa University campus, and they begin walking in silence. It is high noon when they arrive there. The sun is at its peak, and they're both breathing heavily. The heat and the rigorous walk are affecting them. The university campus, which used to be the emperor's palace, is known for its buildings made of black stone, white brick gardens, and marbled floors. The gardens are now famished. The trees have turned golden and dry. The eucalyptus trees are now sleepy and exhausted. The birds do not chirp 
and they look thirsty. The roses are turning black from inattention. Hirut and Hairu are themselves thirsty, but there are no fountains from which they can drink. They increase their pace to look for shade and possibly a place where they can find clean water. They look in vain, but do not give up. And they hold hands as they look for these places. Finally, they spot a dormitory at the far corner of the campus. They walk in and are greeted by a flood of students sitting on the once marbled hallways that are invaded by cracks and holes everywhere. The hallway smells of urine, of sweat, of famished bodies. The students are indifferent to the smells. Some look away as they pass by, others look at them suspiciously. Hailu's elegance draws attention. A student focuses on his designer blue jeans. Another student looks away and another points to hear it and laughs and whispers that he knows what she is now and that she does not belong here. Hirut overhears this and looks down, hides her face. Hailu gently pressed her hand. Reflections on a bench. The sunset is gradually turning the day into a comfortable late afternoon as Hirut and Hailu sit closely together. Hirut's long tresses rest on Hailu's shoulder. He first massages her scalp and strokes the back of her ears, and then he moves to her hands, finally lingering on her palms. She struggles to open her eyes. Twice she lifts her face to see Hailu and then rests her head on his chest and takes a nap. Hailu closes his eyes also. Hailu a naturalized resident of Denmark, is an Ethiopian from the south. By southern Ethiopian standards, he is considered extremely handsome, of dark complexion, curly hair, long legs, thin and tall. His presence commands attention. His eloquence inspires the ears to listen. His eloquence attracts the gaze of admirers, and many consider him to be courteous and gentle to a fault. His manners are synthesis of Danish elegance and Ethiopian humility. Hirut is still asleep, and Hailu is looking at the famished birds, which can no chirp. The hungry dogs, which are barking. The roses, which are no more. The young students sleeping in hallways and the famished grass, the lifeless trees and the emaciated cats, which are dying. He says to himself that everything seems to be on the verge of death in Ethiopia. His eyes are filled with tears. His ears are not listening. His mouth has nothing to smell. His throat is dry. He is contrasting this scene with that of Denmark, remembering the deep green grass, the water fountains, the small Danish bridges at night, the richly green mountains the dark paved roads, the elegant street lamps, the small Danish houses at night, the neon lights, the fast cars, the blonde and brunette Danish girls strolling the narrow streets and the dance floors at discos. Hirut is still asleep and Hailu continues to listen to the quiet. 
the wind is not blowing. The students are still stretched on the dead grass. Nobody talks. There are no words to engage his ears. Nothing moves. A cat dares to move her legs and within seconds her eyes are closed forever. A dog barks and is no more. Heiluis saying to himself that life is Denmark and death is here. He's inspired more than ever to take Hurt with him to Denmark to live and die. Splendor in the night. It is past midnight when they leave the city cafe and move to see Addis, the city of pleasure at night. They settle on a little nightclub by the bank of a lake in one of the suburbs. The wind is blowing in their faces and a couple of times he rests on Hal's broad shoulders when the violent winds, wind jostles her and he does not complain. A classical Ethiopian song, Tizita, is playing as they walk in. It is a favorite of both. Hilo holds Hirut's hand as he directs her toward a far end corner where no one can hear nor recognize them. Hilo breaks the silence and asks her how the last two years have been and she, if you'd like to share her secrets with them. She says, I'll try, but I must warn you, I cannot do it without tears, without pain. He assures her that he would not have it in any other way. So she begins, at first reluctantly, and says, what I remember most are these sexual episodes, being banged against the walls, the slaps on my face, the chairs against which I was pushed. She stops and pulls his hands towards her heart. As she makes the point and tears are gushing out of her, she looks at him, he looks back without moving his eyes. She appears comforted and continues. There was this guy who insisted that he banged me on the wall and that he enjoyed my screams and would hurt me more, more screams. He would joyous, he would whisper in my ears that he enjoyed those screams of pain. She wipes her tears and Hilo dries her face with napkins. Then there were the chairs against which I would lean with tremendous force, accompanied by slaps and when I would be told that I'm actually enjoying it, even when I say with the sincerest thought that I'm too young and too inexperienced for this. The answer was always, you little bitch, you lie. I would then surrender and the pain afterwards would last for weeks. And before I could heal, I would be banged again and again. She looks away. Enough for tonight, she says. Let us listen to the music. The splendor in the night continues. The singer is singing in the background. As we move towards death, time moves fast. Too fast. Enjoy the moment, all that there is at the moment. Hailu and Hugh sing along and they celebrate being together. Cheers to life.
to the passing moments, they say, she holds his hands and tell him and tells him that she has a special story to share. He smiles and says, go ahead. She begins. There was this boy, who I still remember fondly, one I met a year after I began in the prostitution business. During those days, I sat outside waiting on customers. Most would invite themselves without hesitation. This young customer was different. He came to the neighborhood in search of an adventure. Tall, thin like a feather, with an energetic face about my age. He walked by me without a word, no eye contact, as if he had something to hide. He would circle around the block several times. I sought eye contact with him to no avail. This happened on several nights. Finally, to make it easier on him, I decided to make the move. I invited him in. Before he accepted, he made sure that nobody was allowed. It was dark outside, without street lights. He walked in quickly and sat on the bed, which was in the tin shack, without space for my chairs. He surveyed the room in less than a second within a single glance. He finally looked at me and I said to him, you are not this, right? He nodded in agreement and dressed him and told him that I will teach him everything he ought to know. Again, he nodded. We went at it. He did not last long. But it did not matter, and I told him so. He got up to leave, but I insisted that he spend the night. I felt comfortable with him. He was exactly my age. Everything felt right. His gentle touch, his purity moved me, and I drank from his innocent eyes. I wanted to be loved, but did not know if I could ever love. From then on, he came once a week, sometimes more, and I looked forward to it and never took a penny from him. One day, he stopped coming, and it has been three years since I have heard from him. Hailu says, it's a sweet story. You sound as if you are still in love with him. Love? She says, only if I knew what it was. Prostitution has taken care of that. How could a bang body ever love? On love. What can I get you, says a westeros, elegant, thin, and of medium height, with a mild voice, as Hirut and Hailu are both preparing to pour out what is on their minds, but neither seems capable of doing this. The waitress stands there for a while until both realize that she's waiting on them. Oh, I'm sorry, but would like to have two cappuccinos and two butter cakes, I says. The waitress takes the orders and trots into the kitchen. The long, humid day is turning into an early evening as they both sit looking at each other intently as if they're reading each other's interior lives. Hailu is looking outside. Hirut is looking outside as Hailu is busily folding a napkin. He looks outside too, only to be startled to witness a young man beating an emaciated dog that can hardly bark for merely following him. Hirut informs him that this is the normal scene in Addis, that hundreds of dogs are killed this way. She tells him that it appears that 
It's the poor who take their frustrations out on animals since they cannot take it on the inept regime in power. She very briefly informs him that the regime in power is ruthless and that she's part of a student movement who are organizing to change the regime in power, but she cannot say anymore. She nervously looks around and stops talking. He understands and abruptly changes the topic and asks her if she has ever laughed. She smiles and says, how can I? One needs time to think about love. One needs time to think about love. And time is what I do not have. Time for me is about survival. From moment to moment, from one pain to another pain. Hmm, time you say, what does time have to do with love? Everything, she says. Before he would come finish with Hailu, her cell phone rings and he watches as she's hearing bad news. She gets up to leave and tells him that she'll call him later in the evening. Her last words keep on appearing in his dreams when he goes home and uncharacteristically goes to bed very early. He tosses and turns all night long, waiting for her call and that he can hear, all that he can hear is only the creaking of his bed. In a mood for love. He calls three days later and apologizes profusely. She's so sincere that Hailu forgives her immediately. All that he asks about is her well-being. He can sense from her tone that she's genuinely impressed by his courtesy and gentleness. She almost tells him so, but does not need to. I cannot wait to see you, she says. Your face is following me everywhere I go, and it gives me a good feeling, she adds, shyly but compellingly. I feel the same way, is all that he says, very quietly, but she hears it well. So they meet again at the city cafe. When she comes in, she gives him a hug that is etched on his soul. So he says to a friend years later, when he remembers this episode of his life. She informs him that her brother Samson is seriously sick from contaminated water that he drank. He has diarrhea and has been bedridden for three days. She has had to attend to his condition without the necessary resources, and she has been simultaneously comforting her mother at the local clinic. While telling him these stories, not once does she stray away from the excitement of seeing him, being with him, looking at him. Her gaze floods his body and he reciprocates with his eyes, seeing every part of her, her short but elegant legs, her chiseled nose, her long hair, her thin hands. He looks at her deeply, their eyes lock three times and their legs accidentally meet under the table several more. She pulls her legs away from his and he away from hers reluctantly. At one point, he touched the tangles of her, long, of her long hair. His hands linger there and she briefly closes her eyes. An admiring customer, an admiring customer gazes and he with an hailu smile at him. He quickly turns his face away the customer says to himself that this couple is in a mood for love. Hailu remembers. Here it lifts her face to see if Hailu is still there. Assured that he is, she goes back to sleep. Hailu kisses her lightly. He examines her body closely, beginning with her almond-shaped eyes, moving to her full-grown brown lips, further to her small ears, passing by her chiseled nose, his eyes finally resting on her thin and long neck, leading to her long and black hair, which he touches lightly. 
he opens and closes his eyes several times until he's suddenly invaded by memory. Denmark takes hold of him. Hailu remembers the first month at the university in Denmark where he went to study medicine. and become the brightest Ethiopian of his generation. He was put in a dormitory for the first three years with Varg, a Norwegian. During the first month, he suffered from the bitter Danish cold. He put piles of clothes on himself, but nothing helped. When he learned that he must either adapt or suffer interminably, he chose to change and so to be Danish. He always took the existentialist view that the human is a product of his choices and choice resistance to suffering. He always took the existential view that the human is a product of his choices and chose resistance to suffering. Once he resolved, his suffering abated. But then, something else was bothering him. Every morning, he discovered that the windows of the bedroom would be open, despite the freezing cold. He kept on wondering why the windows were open. He suffered quietly. One morning, he discovered that Varg was putting a heavy blanket on Heil's body. But the windows remained open. He finally confronted Varg and asked him why he left the windows open and was also covering his nose and putting blankets on him. Visibly embarrassed, Varg told him, that he couldn't stand the smell of Hilo's body and asked Hilo what he ate smell the way he did. Characteristically cool, Hilo simply told Varg that he too smelled Varg's odor but trained himself to get used to it. Varg was embarrassed. And that event became a moment of learning for both. Hailu remembers this event and faintly laughs. Remembers the intensity of Varg's embarrassment on that bitter morning. He remembers Varg's promise to never do that again. He remembers how that tool confrontation changed things between him and Varg and how it deeply cemented their friendship. The next day, he promises Hiro that he will call the next day, and he does. Hey, what a man. You always fulfill your promises, even those as tiny as saying that you will call tomorrow, says Hiro exuberantly. The least I can do, Hilo replies. I have made your news for you. What? I can't wait, says Hirut, as she's perspiring. Ready? I just got a job offer which I cannot refuse. Hilo says, with a faint sound of joy, which he never advertises. Following advice given to him, by his Eastern philosophy instructor. One should never submit to joy and sadness, since both feelings are never permanent. And joy is always impregnated with sadness, and sadness is also a potential joy for those who wait. 
What is the new job? He would ask. And Heil replies, it's a dream job at a world-class hospital in America, in the city of Boston. And I must move to Boston within the next two months to start this new career. America, that's my dream. I can't tell you how I am feeling right now. She takes a deep breath and asks, does this mean that we can all join in the USA when the situation permits, she asks. Looking on. Here it is looking outside aimlessly. Suddenly, a very young boy, not older than five, carrying newspapers three times his weight, flashes a generous smile at her and asks her if she would be interested in a newspaper. She says, of course, and gives him ten American dollars. The boy cannot believe his eyes, is literally shocked. He had the equivalence of 170 burr in his hands. He rolls the bill back and forth and cannot help himself from swinging his arms around Hilt's neck, and she reciprocates. As the boy leaves, he walks backwards so that he can continue to see the face of the young woman who's given him enough to live on for a full year. The boy stands out of the window where Hilt is sitting and waves his hands as tears of joy travel down his cheeks and onto his mouth. He slowly disappears in the meandering streets of shanty towns. He tries to keep her eyes on him as he walks through the deafening crowd. The sweltering heat rests on his tiny body. She wonders about the boy. She imagines him falling down on his knees weighed down by the newspapers that he cannot sell. She imagines him being scolded by a cruel boss for not delivering the money, but rather returning empty-handed, except for one paper, normally sold for one bill, which he will have to give to the cruel boss from his own pocket. He is afraid that the boy might lose the money on his way home. She is hoping that he will go straight home and hand the money to his mother if he has one. She prepares herself to leave for a meeting that her student friends have invited her at a secret place. Hi, Lou's family. There's a mansion close to an Ethiopian palace that many Ethiopians have been eyeing for years. The villa has 10 rooms inside and eight small rooms in a guest house in the back. There is a garage for five cars two cottages in the far end of the backyard, and the villa rests in the center where cars drive around it in a deep circular driveway, and when they must, the cars park there. The driveway can park 15 cars at a time. This villa belongs to Hailu's mother. His father, who died many years ago, left the property to his wife. Hailu's mother, who is now 70 years old but remains fiercely active, Hailu is her only son, but her extended family is large, and she does not like friends nor relatives. She's in doubt with both. She has continued to live there for the past 30 years, ever since her loving husband died at the modest age of 65 from complications of blood pressure and diabetes. Hailu's mother is still mourning her husband's death. Everybody says that Hailu's father was an extraordinary husband who loved his wife and adored Hailu, his only son. By Ethiopian standards, Hailu is well-bred, and according to tradition, whomever he marries must also come from a similar breed. Interbreeding among unequals is forbidden by tradition among members of the Ethiopian upper class. This awareness has been burdening Hailu ever since he met a hero who clearly does not come from a similar background. Hailu's mother informs him fondly that an Ethiopian family with their lovely daughter will pay a visit before he departs and that she wants him to be there in his best to meet with them. As usual, 
he heeds her call, and in less than two hours, the family arrives with an impressive young daughter. Hailu meets the family. The daughter sits right next to him and makes her introduction as a fresh graduate of Stanford University with a degree in French literature. Her parents are visibly proud of her, and Hailu's mother leaves no doubt that this attractive lady from the right class is God sent for Hailu. Hailu's attitude suggests otherwise. And the mother is annoyed with her son. The young girl is obviously taken with Hailu, but she too detects that uh, his mind is elsewhere. After the family leaves, his mother tells him that this is the girl that she wishes for him and that an arrangement will soon be made to seal the relationship. Hailu almost opens his mouth to disagree with his mother, but he thinks of engaging the matter with a letter from Denmark. His mother waits for an answer, but she does not get one immediately. Hailu and his mother. While Hailu is preparing to leave for the airport, after first seeing Hirut, his ailing mother calls him to her bedroom. Hailu enters. Ben sticks his mom on the forehead and she asks him to sit and have a word with her. Hailu agrees and sits on a sofa to the right of his mother. Before his mother speaks, a chirping bird enters the bedroom and rests on the rails of the large cherry bed. The bird charms the mother and Hailu waves at it and the bird chirps in return. Hailu and his mother look at each other. He looks down to the floor as his mother says, Hailu, as you know, the good Lord has been nice to me and kept me for the last 70 years, but now I feel that he'll take me any day and I feel the pressure of seeing you with a wife. Hailu says, I agree with you, mother, and I'm working on it. Mother says, what do you mean by working on it? In our culture, this work is done by the parents and have arranged for a good, educated wife from a noted family. The young girl whom you saw yesterday has agreed to marry you. All that I need is your consent. Ailu says, no, mother. This cannot be. I am an educated Ethiopian who must choose for himself. His mother says defiantly, your mother's wishes must outweigh your education, son. I did not educate you to disobey me. This kind of behavior is unacceptable from a well-bred young man. You must keep the dignity of your class and marry accordingly, Hailu. Hailu replies, Mother, however dearly I love you, I'm not going to compromise my right to choose a life partner according to a tradition that I do not respect. This particular tradition is a tradition that Ethiopians must reject. His mother is now furious and says, Hailu, I'm disappointed in you and have nothing more to say or do except die as a disappointed mother. The case is closed for now. You can talk to me when you're ready to accept my wishes. In the meantime, I wish you well in Denmark. She covers her face to avoid seeing him as he leaves. Hailu carefully closes the bedroom door and gets in a taxi to leave for Hirut. He has five hours before departing for Denmark.
I would now move towards the ending. I'll read from a section called Trapped. I have four minutes left. Waves of lines invade her eyes while her face is grinding against the present ground. All that she sees is a caravan of waves swimming in her eyes. To her left is a wall covered with insect feces. To her right, Ants are colonizing the wall. The ground which her tiny face is pressing against is home to famished cockroaches. Every part of her is tired except her imagination. She falls into a dream. She stands in the middle of a desert, lonely and apprehensive. She looks everywhere in search of life. There is none to be found. She hears a voice which says, trapped, trapped. The voice stops. Are you trapped? The voice asks. She doesn't answer. Dark fluid runs out of her mouth. She's surprised that she can release fluid. She thinks that its blood wipes her mouth and her face falls to the ground. She can hear it crash. White fluid drips to the ground, making dripping music against the floor. Inside it is silent, one he can hear the quiet of darkness. Every living thing has submitted to sleep except for Hurt. Trapped are you not, says the voice, this time louder and very clearly. She tries to look up, to look, to locate the origin of the voice. Her eyes cannot carry on, all her senses are shut off, and she is left only with a capacity for dreaming. This fact reminds her of Descartes' first meditation in which the philosopher feels that all his senses have died except for his power of thinking. She tries to smile at this. Again, she cannot. The voice returns. There is a way out. Wait and see. Stay fast and hold your ground. But resume eating, says the voice. She briefly opens her eyes. The world outside and hears birds tweeting, trees dancing, and brooks singing. The moment she closes her eyes, a cobra strikes, aiming for her lame hands. Suddenly, she musters all her strength to protect her hands, and the voice says, well done, girl, you see, more is coming but, but your way, but you must eat. This has been your host, Theodor Skios, reading from Hilton Hilo. Thanks for tuning in and staying with us.